So this has been uh, a little series that we've uh, developed on um, medical <clears throat> errors, and what we do is look at our own error cases, analyze them, and uh, try to learn from our own experience. Cliff, let me turn to you. Let's see. Uh, let's see your case. Sure. So you know the theme of my case is it's. Um, you know, the Meniere's disease really is a disease or diagnosis of exclusion. And I'm going to talk about a mistake uh, that I made earlier in my career, which actually was serendipitous in that it, it changed and actually was the focus of my research and clinical surgical development. But here's a patient, a 37-year-old female. She had hearing loss unilaterally. She did have a remote history of a disease at the time I wasn't too aware of called von hippel lindau disease. And she had fluctuating left side hearing loss, and she had been diagnosed with Meniere's disease. And uh, here it shows that she had a fairly substantial low frequency hearing loss, which is very characteristic of Meniere's disease. And her ENG showed some weakness in that ear uh, from a caloric standpoint. And I treated her and treated her and uh, for actually a good period of time. Her, uh, how was her speech discrimination, uh, Cliff? And she had uh, let's, uh, probably 72% or 78%, not bad, uh, not bad speech discrimination. Um, and she had fluctuating hearing loss, which was really uh, had, me, had me going. And... Uh, the thing that I did was um, I found out that part of her evaluation for von Hippel-Lindau disease, which was having yearly MRIs to rule out cerebellar hemangioblastoma, which is one of the deadliest forms of VHL, and uh, her neurologist said that all of her MRIs were negative, so I asked if I could see them. And up you see an MRI of what I saw when I looked at them. Indeed, the posterior fossa was clean, but you see the black arrows point to a mass and actually on both sides, actually in the endolymphatic sac and duct. And actually about that time, I embarked upon some research when I was a fellow at HMS at Mass Lionier, and we found that the endolymphatic sac and duct, and if we blow this picture up, um, you could actually, the endolymphatic sac and duct can give rise to a papillary neoplasm that is identical to many of the tumors that uh, happen in von Hippel-Lindau. Later on, it was shown by my colleagues at, at the NIH that indeed, uh, by having obstruction of your endolymphatic sac and duct, you can actually have dilatation of the inner ear structures and have uh, really the pathologic correlate of Meniere's disease developed really from a non-idiopathic reason. So my challenge was to figure out how to get rid of this tumor because it was making her sick, and I knew the long-term sequela was bad. So we devised a, a surgical technique myself, uh, David Haynes, the second author and the senior author at the time, was Michael Glasscock, a very well-known surgeon. Uh, we call it the retrolabyrinthine transdural approach where we can actually resect the tumor, including the involving dura, and actually save the inner structures and save hearing. And uh, what I was really uh, excited about, it worked very well for her, and then uh, the team at uh, NIH uh, recently published, it, actually not recently, 2005, a uh, series that used a similar surgical approach that we described in smaller tumors and were able to save hearing. And uh, this is a very uh, well uh, executed procedure that is now very well documented and is done all the time. So the issue with von Hippel-Lindau disease is that uh, it is a, a disease that only until 2000, early 2000s, it was known that one of the tumors that it gives rise to is tumors of the inner ear, specifically the endolymphatic sac and duct. And in fact, those tumors are called endolymphatic sac tumors. Um, not only do you have tumors of the ear, like we just showed, but you have visceral neoplasms of the uh, kidney and the brain. And what we found in VLH and ELST in a later publication was that actually in von Hippel-Lindau disease, there's a if you're going to have a tumor, there's a 30% chance it's going to be bilateral, where people who have endolymphatic sac tumors, and almost all of them present with what seems to be Meniere's disease, their tumors are usually unilateral. So in von Hippel-Lindau disease, there's a 30% chance it's going to affect both ears, and you really have a short period of time to get the tumor out and save hearing if indeed you're going to. And these last two slides point out what happens if you miss it. So we later on published a paper of a grading system with my colleague here in neurosurgery department, Nick Bampakitis, the grading system. And as you see in grade two tumors, they actually expand into the posterior fossa fairly substantially and then uh, they can move on. And in an advanced tumor, such as grade four, they'll advance through the middle cranial fossa, through the anterior cranial fossa, and they're unresectable and fatal and was fatal in this patient. So, so the issues are, number one, many years disease, in my opinion, is a diagnosis of exclusion. I don't think even if you have the classic hearing loss, 
complaints of vertigo, tinnitus, that you really need to image those folks because if you have a tumor, mass, lesion, it can be more than just an endolymphatic sac tumor that compresses the endolymphatic sac and duct, you can produce everything that looks and smells like Meniere's disease. Um, so, uh, and then the other issue is more germane to VHL, and I'll pass on that right now. 